So we're actually going to start in the process of building your profitable web design business with the absolute fundamentals, with the base that every business really needs if it's going to be super successful. So we're going to be looking at brand and position. And you can sum this up by saying that what we're going to do is we're going to establish a unique identity for your business that perfectly matches what your market needs. And I'll take you through it. It's a really good step-by-step -step process. So first of all, what are branding and positioning? Well, branding is really the process of creating an impression. If I say a brand name to you, if you think about a particular company, business, whatever it is, what do you think? What are the emotions that you connect with that? So really, a brand is it's, it's not a logo, it's not a strap line, it's not any of those things. It is the sum total of what people think and feel when they think about this particular company or offering or, or product or whatever it is. So everything that you do, everything that you publish or convey or communicate or represent, anything you do that touches the outside world in any way, that is all branding. And branding can either be conscious or it can be unconscious. Everything has a brand. Now, if it's been thought about, chosen and deliberately planned to be a certain way, that's conscious branding. If you haven't done that, then you've got a brand out there, but it's done in an unconscious way that you can't really control. So branding should be conscious. Now, positioning is part of branding. And what it means is consciously and deliberately seeking to own a concept in your market's mind. So, for example, the, the concept might be ethical cosmetics or it might be SEO plugins for WordPress or luxury weekend retreats. It doesn't really matter what the concept may be, but if you think about one term and then you, you'll immediately, if, if you've got brands that you connect with that term, then they'll be in some kind of list. You normally like, you know, the first thing that springs to mind, the second thing or the third thing. So if I say online bookstore, you'll think Amazon, maybe then Barnes and Noble, and then you'll probably run out of things. Right, so we've all got a short list in our mind that we refer to. It's, it's a shortcut for if we need a book online, ping. What's the first thing? Where do I, where do I think of first? Where am I going to go first? So that's positioning. Amazon has the number one position in my mind and probably yours for online bookstore, maybe online CDs as well. So that, that's really what positioning is. It's saying we want to be the mm -mm, for, you know, we want to be the number one for that particular thing, whatever that thing may be. So why does all of this matter? It's actually probably the single most important thing that you can do for your business. If you think about it at a high level, marketing is matching offerings to market. So there's a need out there and then you supply the need, right? There are two ways of doing it. You can either say, I've got some stuff to sell. I need to find somebody to buy it. Or you say, hang on, there's something that people need out, out in the world there that is not being served right now. Let's fulfill that need. Generally, the latter approach is preferable. That, that's the entrepreneur's approach. But they're both valid. Now, positioning is the absolute essence of marketing. If marketing is matching offerings and needs, positioning is, is saying... How well can we do that? And it works at the most fundamental level. If you get your branding positioning right, you will find that everything else in your business follows far more easily and smoothly. Because you will know exactly who your market is. You will know exactly who you are, what you stand for. And you will be able to communicate and express with clarity and with confidence exactly why people should be choosing you. So this is how I would sum up what we are trying to achieve in this positioning exercise. You should choose a position that reflects as closely as possible what your market needs and the best that you can possibly be. Now let's break that down. 
this is a, a position. So you want to be really number one for something. So we're about choosing that something. It reflects, okay? So if you imagine like jigsaw pieces, yeah, one shape is the opposite of the other shape, so they fit together perfectly. So if your market has a particular shape, you, your position should perfectly reflect that shape. So you want to reflect as closely as possible what your market needs. So a market, it can be expressed in terms of a need or an opportunity. What do people need? What are they going to invest in? What are they going to part with money for? Okay, so there's a need. Needs drive action. Nothing else really drives action. And, okay, so it's not just the, the market's need, but also the best that you can possibly be. And the reason why I've put it this way is because we've got to think big. We mustn't just assume that what we think we're good at now, what we think we do now, that that's it, right? If we're going to be profitable, if we're going to go out there into the world and make a big difference, then we need to challenge ourselves to be the best that we can be. And this is what 80-20 challenges us to do, you know, 80% of the impact and the benefit that you generate in your life comes from just 20% of the stuff that you do. So what is that stuff? What are your special powers? And I would certainly advise starting a list and saying my special powers are these are the things that I'm really, really good at. Another thing you can do is contact half a dozen people who know you well and say, what am I really good at? What are my special powers? Right, then write that down on a list, read it out, read it out loud and own that stuff. So the challenge here, if you're going to go out and really kill it out there in the market, you need to be your Superman as much of the time as you can. You need to stop being Clark Kent. You need to be Superman. So we're looking for a match here where there's a need in the market and there's something that you can be if you exercise your special powers, if you play your biggest game, if you are bold, if you are confident, which will enable you to meet that need head on and solve that problem. And really, I would say that you know when your position is getting close to the correct one, when it scares you a bit. I'm not saying this process should be all nice and easy and safe and fluffy. It's not going to be. If you're going to be the best that you can possibly be, it's going to shake you a little bit. So be prepared for that. So we start by thinking about, well, what is my market? And how do we express that in terms of a need? What do people need? Is there a need that isn't being met out there? And then how perfectly can you reflect that need? Maybe you can't, you don't feel like you can do it right now. Maybe you're not confident you can do it right now. But is it possible that you could step up and meet that need? So let's start with what is your market? Now, we've already covered this, I think. I'm pretty clear you don't need to be talking to the general website building market. Right? You don't want to be a everyday high street website designer because the market for websites is absolutely enormous and there's a lot of web designers out there. So you'll be one in a huge herd. I believe you need to choose a niche where you can thrive and one which suits your strengths. If you think of it in evolutionary terms, you want to find a place where you can thrive, where you can grow, where you can dominate, where you can be highly, highly successful. So you need to find that environment that's perfectly suited to you and you need to step up and be perfectly suited to the environment as well. Now, the reason for this is that if you can do well in a particular niche, that generates positive reinforcement. If you imagine that you choose a particular type of company with a particular type of problem, you go out there and say, I'm the guy to solve that problem, I'm the girl to solve that problem. You do it, you hit a home run on that. 
you've then got an amazing story to take to other members of that same niche community. When they see that you've achieved goals that they recognize, overcome challenges that they may share for clients that they know and respect and that you can show specific results that they also want for themselves, why wouldn't they choose you? Why would they go to a general generic web designer? So that's how the positive reinforcement works. And you've then got an advantage within that niche. Then you can start to dominate that niche. The opposite of that, if you're a generalist, you're always fighting entropy. Entropy is the tendency for energy to dissipate, for things to cool down. You know, the universe expands and all cools down. Entropy is the entropy is what happens if you take a box of matches, uh, light them all, and then throw them all on the floor. Right? They're going to they're die out. They're going to die down. The, the energy is all going to dissipate. Nothing else happens. Positive reinforcement would be taking that match and setting fire to something. When you focus that energy in one place, and then you build up your, your little fire with twigs and then sticks and then logs, and you've got a, a huge fire going then. So I want you to be thinking about what is your point? What's your point? This is an image, happens to be a, a microscopic image of a virus. Okay, But I want you to think that this could represent you and the shape can also represent your market. Now let's look at you in terms of this spiky ball. Okay, Everyone's different. Everyone's got their unique experiences, their unique loves, hates, talents, strengths, weaknesses, all of this stuff. So you've got your unique spiky ball shape. And these different points that come off from you represent the things that are special about you. And at the end of those points are the, point, the, the, the times in your life when you've been able to express something so well when you've been able to achieve something with clarity with precision and all of us have got a list of successes so something else you could do if you've got that piece of paper where you're you know jotting down your your special powers how about writing down these are the biggest successes that I've ever had it could be in work it could be in education it could be anywhere right anything that you've been involved in where you've done something brilliant and amazing and you've achieved the very best results right those are your points and interestingly the shape of these points happen to match the 80 20 curve as well and there's all sorts of stuff in the middle there's all sorts of stuff that you're kind of good at that lots of people do all the generic stuff we're not interested in that stuff we're interested in the stuff that makes you not just unique but uniquely capable of achieving great things so that's what we're trying to get here so what we want to do is identify as many of these points as possible and then pick one where your skills and experience and passions combine that also happens to match a specific need that's out there in the marketplace Okay, and the marketplace is similar to this as well. The marketplace has generic needs and generic problems that are commonly shared. And you can describe those as kind of price of entry problems and needs. So these are the things that you have to be able to do. You have to be able to make them a website that they can update themselves, for example, or it you know has to be found on Google. You know, th this stuff isn't particularly unique in terms of a problem. It's the stuff you have to do anyway. But everyone and every business out there, every potential client out there, has got some specific sharp pain. Specific points that represent problems, needs, opportunities that they would just love to capitalize on, that they'd love to solve. And what we're looking for is something that you can do that they need. And where those two points meet, that's when the magic's going to happen. So let's start looking at choosing your market. A good market at the basic level should match three criteria. First, there's a need or an opportunity 
that is strong enough for people to invest money to solve or to capitalize on. It's a need or an opportunity that is strong enough that people are going to invest money. If a market is not commercial at all, then how are you going to have a profitable business serving that market? I'd invite you to start thinking about profits and profitability in terms of it representing the good that you are doing in the world. The more good that you can do in the world, the more profitable your business should be and the richer you should get. Do not fear being rich. Do not fear being profitable. It's a good thing and it's a sign that you are creating a lot of value. There's no merit in delivering little value and getting little reward for it. Secondly, it should be a market that you're actually interested in. If you don't care about something, if you're not passionate about it, if you don't like it, you're not going to want to spend time dealing with it. I'm really interested in what makes websites work, and that's what I teach people. I'm recording this video on a Sunday afternoon because it's something that it's it's a hobby for me as well as my work. And that thirdly, it's got to be something should be something where you're qualified. In other words, you've got relevant experience in this area. You can talk its language. You're part of a group. So any market that you consider should be identifiable by a particular need that people are going to spend money to solve and happens to be something that you're interested in and have some level of qualification. Now, that doesn't have to be a formal qualification, just has to mean that the market is going to recognize some experience that you have that qualifies you to, to comment and to talk about it with some authority. So, starting with, are you interested and qualified? Here are some ideas, and this might be a good time to use the... Uh, and this might be a good time to uh, pick up your pencil again. Write down what valuable work experience you have. Now, with a lot of these things, we'll all have a tendency to forget the stuff that we've done in the past and to focus on the things that we can't do or the things that we feel like we need to learn. But we've all got lots of useful experience. Nobody living today has the same experience that you have. So let's get it down on paper. Let's write it down. Write down all the jobs that you've done. What have you learned in those jobs? What have you been good at? And also list all the groups that you've ever been a member of. Now this could be formal groups or informal groups, tribes, whatever it is. Write them all down. Write down all the hobbies that you've ever been passionate about. If I think back, then I've been interested in fast cars. You know, I used to read all the magazines about that when I was like a teenage boy. I was interested in survival and air rifle shooting and religion and mountain biking and rock climbing and all these kinds of things. I've actually been part of those communities and I've been passionate about those hobbies. Now, even though I've not been involved in mountain biking for years and years, if somebody came up to me, I could have a conversation with that person that shows that I have that kind of level of qualification, credibility that we're talking about. I, I speak their language. I've got experiences in mountain biking that will help me to communicate and talk the same language as somebody who's in it today. So whose language do you speak? What are these groups, companies, cultures? Now, I'm not, we're not talking about, you know, different, do you speak Spanish and English and, and whatever, necessarily, although that's perfectly valid, you know, because um, ethnic or cultural or religious groups this all this stuff counts so whose language do you speak what groups out there can you go into and speak their language and also think about what causes you support what do you believe in what will you stand up for in the world and any of these things could serve to give you an insight into an area where that meets those those criteria you're qualified okay because you've got experience in in that area there's money in it and you care about it 
So out of all these things on there, maybe put a circle around anything that you specifically really care about. Because when you're emotionally connected to something, you're going to be passionate about it, you're going to want to work at it, and you're going to be able to communicate with people on an emotional level. And we all are emotional be beings, we all work on that emotional level. So is there a need? Moving on to the next step. So we've identified some areas where we might be qualified. Is there a need? So let's just start by thinking about what needs people may have in terms of web design, web marketing potentially. So it might be websites for churches, for example. So do a search on Google for that need. And then just look, are people paying for pay-per-click ads? There are some searches you can do on Google where there's no ads appear down the side. And those are non-commercial searches. There's no money in it. It's not connected to any kind of problem that anyone's got a strong enough interest to solve that um, other people will be able to, to make money out of solving it. All right? It's very, very simple. You can also then find out how much people are willing to pay for those ads by looking on the, the keyword planner on Google. And then finally, you need to ask yourself, is there an unserved tribe? Now, these are, these are ideals. If you're really looking for a, a market where you can really dominate, the ideal would be to find a need out there that literally no one is serving now. Right? There's a group of people who have some kind of congregation. They have some, somewhere where they meet, either in real life or online. And, and they've got this specific need that nobody is solving now. Taking it to another level, ideally what you want is a starving crowd. There's a classic story. If you just do a Google search for starving crowd and look up the story of, I think, Gary Halbert, talking to a group of students, and he was saying, Look, I've got a burger van, you've got a burger van. Um, I'll give each of you can choose one thing, one advantage, right? One particular feature or benefit of your business, your burger, burger van business, that um, you think will help you beat me, and I'm just going to have one advantage. And they all came out with things, you know, smart uniforms, big signage, fresh organic meat, blah, 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 blah. And he said, yep, yeah, all that's good stuff, all that's good stuff, but I beat you guys. Because the advantage I choose is a starving crowd. Starving crowd means there's a lot of people, and they are desperate for what you have. It's a life or death issue for them. Now, I'm not saying that all of us are going to be able to go out there and identify a starving crowd that is literally not being served now, but it can happen. And particularly, when you're in a service industry, if, you're, if you've got a service business like web design, you don't actually need a huge market. If you can get by with six clients per year, then it doesn't have to be a crowd-sized market, which is why... I'm saying, yeah, let's let's look at particular niche markets as well. Because you can get by by choosing a smaller niche and by serving that niche very specifically. Here's an example. I just typed in work at home moms into Google. And down the right hand side of that page, you can see lots and lots of ads. Work at home, earn money at home, blah, blah, blah. Work at home jobs, work from home today. Lots of competition there. If I look it up in the uh, Google Keyword Planner, we see similar things. We've got a number of exact monthly searches. Lots of people are typing in work from home, working from home, work from home jobs. Right? This, so this is saying it's quite a big market. There's a big need. Also, if you notice, the competition is quite high. And then this will also tell me how much people are bidding for this kind of, for, for ads on these phrases. Now, these average cost per click prices aren't particularly high. There are some markets that are much, much more expensive than that. These are, you know, under the $1 mark. So that might suggest to me, just looking at these numbers, that there's quite a few people looking for this stuff. And there's quite a lot of competition out there. But there isn't maybe a big fortune to be made in it. But at least we know, yes, there is a market here, and people are competing and spending in that market. So it passes that 
and a f just first barrier. I would also very much recommend you to use your common sense though. Let's take something like a market like Baptist Church, right? Find a Baptist Church gets 30 searches worldwide on Google. This is rough numbers, right? 30 searches worldwide a month and the suggested average bid price is zero. People are not bidding for uh, find a Baptist Church because why would you? There's, there's no direct commercial benefit in it. However, there are a lot of churches and most of them are going to need websites. So just because there isn't a big commercial market now doesn't mean there isn't a niche for you. You've got to use your common sense. If you know, if you just feel that there's something where you've got a specific uh, advantage and you know that people are spending money there, even if it's not on Google, even if you can't prove it that way, then you might have uh, identified a potential niche. This doesn't mean that you can just go blindly into something saying, I believe that people will spend money on this particular area. You've got to have really good reason to do it. Now, soft research can also really help. What that means is, this isn't numerical. This is about the emotions. This is about how people think and feel in a way that can't be expressed in numbers and dollars and searches on Google. So literally, what this is about is interviewing your potential market. Speak to some people. If you want to be, say for example, I am the, the person who does websites for Baptist churches in the Southwest US, for example, right? Now, there's a lot of, of Baptist churches in the Southwest of the United States, right? Or, or one particular state, you know? You only need a fraction of that market to have a, a, a profitable business. So, contact some of those people and say, I want to talk to you about your experiences in marketing, in promoting your church and your mission, whatever, online. Uh, could you spend, could you spare 10, 15 minutes of your time for me to either come in and talk to you or give you a phone call? And you, you ask some questions. And what those questions are going to be pertaining to is going to be, you're looking for what have their frustrations been? Where have they been disappointed? Where have they wasted money? Where have they experienced pain in online marketing previously? So it could be, oh, we spent a lot of money and we got a website that didn't do anything and we couldn't update it ourselves and we had to pay the web designer every time we wanted to make a change and we didn't like that. Then we got another website that we could update ourselves, but it was quite complicated to do. And then the person who was updating it moved on and you know went to a, a different city and then nobody could do it. And that was difficult as well. So... All of these things are showing you where they're losing money, they're experiencing pain, there's friction, and in some way they are not fulfilling their real goals. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the real emotional drive. Where are they being affected in a way that, you know, they, they care about? It's causing pain, it's causing upset, it's causing confusion. Also, Try and find out, is there something that they really needed but for some reason could never express? Is there some kind of underlying motive behind the disappointments that they may have experienced? I mean, people actually like to talk about their experiences and they like to have a moan as well. And they, the answers that you get for this stuff can be absolute marketing gold. Make sure you record it all because you could then use this in your website, you could write a marketing report or an ebook, and then maybe publish it saying, here are the top 10, you know, re new research shows the top 10 problems that most Baptist churches face in relation to um, pub publishing on the internet. And people may want to read that and they'll read it and they'll see their own needs and problems reflected in it. And then at the end, it says, this is from so-and-so who is the person yeah, specializes in helping you know, businesses or organizations of this type to achieve this certain thing in this certain area. Do you see how it works? Okay, so now we want to articulate the market and the need. Right? How can we do this concisely and efficiently? As we've said, market can be described in terms of the need 
or the opportunity, which is a variant of the need. So describe your market as succinctly as you can. This has to be something that there's money in it, you, be, you believe there's money in it, where you are qualified to talk to that market, you speak their language, and it's something that you care about. So go over your list, go over your list of things until you found one where you think that all those things are met. Now, you want to describe the market in terms of its problem. What do they need? What do they want to achieve that they aren't achieving so well now? Also think, what other factors could help identify that market? For example, it could, it could be geographical. It could be one particular state, one particular geographical area. It could be size, like small businesses or growing businesses or work from home mums, or a kind of level of maturity, you know, startups or, for example. So look at your history, your back catalogue. Where have you got that specific kind of experience? Independent hotels, maybe florists or mobile dog washers or whatever it may be, or even communities that are involved in playing some kind of game. Look at all those communities that you've been part of and see what factors could be brought to bear to help you sharpen that point. And of course, is it an important need that prospects will be motivated enough to solve, they'll be so motivated, that they'll actually invest money in it. Okay, so when all those things are met, we can move forward. Now we're going to look at starting to kind of polish that and, and really sharpen that. This is something that I've developed before. It's called the customer value triangle. And basically, you've got these three key factors, speed and quality and price. Now, customers always want something perfect now and free, but you can't have that. So one, um, one way that you can kind of uh, communicate with customers and f help them to find out what's important to them can be to say, um, almost like, you know, price, quality, speed, pick two. You want know, fast, good, and cheap, pick two, okay? But the if you put that into a triangle like this, I'll explain how it works. You can rotate the triangle any way you like. Now, the way that this triangle is shown now, the price is near the base. So basically what this is saying is you're strong on price. In other words, this is something that's cheap, fairly good quality, but slow, right? because speed is a long way away from the from the baseline. You can rotate this any way you like. If you were to do this for McDonald's, it would be price and speed near the base. Yeah, because McDonald's is cheap and fast. Quality is the least important. However, Starbucks would be different and lots of different, you know, all, all brands have got their own particular balance. You can't have all three. You can't have something fast, good and cheap. So how this can help you to identify this perfect match that we're looking for is to say, okay, well, what does my market want? Are they concerned about speed of getting their, their website solution? Is quality the most important thing? Or are they very, very price sensitive? And do the same for yourself, for yourself as a service provider. Do you, are you happy and comfortable guaranteeing a, a really high level of quality or guaranteeing a very fast turnaround or working cheap? Can you do that and still be profitable? And if you can find a market where its particular rotation of this triangle matches what you want to do, then that's a very good sign. Let's carry on sharpening our point. So. Is speed an issue? You know, do, do you want to work fast or do you want to work slow? How about on the price level? Uh, do you want to be cheap or affordable or at the other end, premium priced? Now, I would recommend that premium pricing is probably the way to go if you're looking at a niche market. Otherwise, you've got to be extremely efficient to be competitive on price and still profitable as well. You don't want to be involved in a race to the bottom. How about on the quality side? Now, no one's going to go out there and say, I'm going to deliver rubbish websites, but there are variants, flavors within 
this question of, of quality. So do you want something that's like a packaged product? So it's relatively cheap and affordable, kind of one, one size fits all. Or do you want a custom bespoke service? All right, so these are different ways of expressing that quality question. And are there any other special insights that you can use that could give your customers an advantage in some particular niche? So this is a case of, again, going over and over your history, your particular experience, to say, is there something that, that you've got that other web designers aren't going to have, which will help your customers to have an advantage? So let's take it up to another level and ask, what is the difficulty that only you can solve? So ask yourself, is there a challenge or complication or difficulty that the people in this market commonly face and which prevents them from achieving the success that they could enjoy? Right? Is there some particular challenge that, that everyone seems to face and is kind of holding everyone back that you can somehow claim to overcome? Let me just give you a few examples. Something might be without the use of drugs. You know, I've, been, I've worked with people before who offer methods to deal with pain without the use of drugs, for example. So without is a key question. You know, what are these things that seem to come with the territory, which we're not quite happy about, but could you find a way to do away with that? How about for a fraction of the cost of the money that everyone kind of feels they have to spend now? Can you help people to be a lot more cost effective or to save money, right, compared to the, the alternative that everyone has to put up with now? Or how about guarantee to return a profit in a certain period of time. Okay, so that's taking away another kind of risk or objection that people may have. So just think about it. What kind of common problems have you got a special insight or skill or experience or method or technique that you think you can will give you a, a competitive advantage over any other web professionals who are talking to that particular market? And here's one more, is you could say that you, know, you can get this kind of service, and there might be several people who can do it, but your specific one is, it's coming from an expert who's got direct experience of. And you can just pick something straight from your list, of uh, from your CV, from your resume. Just, you know, these are all the things you've done in the past. I've got direct experience of working with small chains of hotels, for example. And now let's just take all that stuff and put it all together. So we're going to build now a sentence, really, that communicates your specific point and the market that you're serving. So it could start with something like, I help, and then a specific type of customer, which can be identified by a specific type of problem or challenge or opportunity that they're facing, who need, then you can go into more detail about a specific problem. So you're helping these people who need something to and then achieve a specific type of goal and there's something about the way that you work or how you do it that is some kind of unique insight or value. And then there's something about the way in which you do it. So you don't have to have all of these things and they don't have to be in that order but you should be looking for at least three of these factors which will uniquely identify you that nobody else out there in the marketplace is saying now. And all that makes something that we call an elevator pitch. An elevator pitch is something where you get into an elevator, you've got 30 seconds standing next to somebody else and they say, hi, I'm whatever, what do you do? And you say that sentence. It's a neat, concise sentence that expresses clearly the value that you deliver, who you deliver it to, and how you do it in a unique way. And you can use this then everywhere. Once you've got it, you become this thing. You express it. This is what you are. You can use it on your website strapline. 
You can use it in your LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter profile. You can use it in your email signature on business cards, etc, etc, etc. This is the description of your position in the market. So let me show you just a couple of examples. Here's one that's come out of the Pro Web Design Alliance group. So we've got um, somebody who's, who's working on this elevator pitch. He's saying, I help groups who are working for positive change in their communities, right? That's the market, to use the web cost effectively. That's the particular insight to generate income, build partnerships, and recruit supporters. These are the three goals that are particularly important to community groups. You see how it works? Here's one that I might write for my, for my own business. Could be, I train anyone regardless of experience. Again, that's the particular insight, particular problem that you resolve. To create websites to professional standards. So it's quite specific. Professional standard websites. And the unique thing is that I'll train anyone regardless of experience. And this is the net result that we're looking for. When you've identified a point which perfectly matches a point, a pain point, in your marketplace. So this is an area where you will need to be exercising, taking advantage of as many of the unique things about you as possible. Your experience, your skills, your passions and where that actually matches something that the market wants. So what are you going to do with this? Well, we've got lots more videos to come, but just to summarize briefly, in order to dominate a market, I think the key thing is something I would call a masterpiece case study. So you're looking for a client who is an ideal type of client, and you're going to engage with that client and you're going to invest whatever it takes to make that project a runaway success. So you might cut your costs, you know, give them a discount, throw lots of time at it, hours and days at it, or even find a mentor, come and say to somebody, I need you to help me walk through this process and don't take no for an answer. On the other side, what the client has to provide is, on their side of the trade, they have to agree to give you an outstanding reference or case study and to provide proof of success. You know, like uh, our sales have gone up by this much. This is what people say about it, for example. So everybody wins here. The client might get uh, you to promise and guarantee that you're going to deliver an outstanding result. You might do it for half the normal cost, but this is worth it for you because the best possible advert for your business especially if you're marketing within a particular niche, is a runaway success story within that niche. That's what's going to give you this case study that you can then use to convince other prospects who match that same profile that you are the perfect and ideal person to help them solve their problems. So in the next video, we're going to move on from the branding and positioning, and we're going to look at the ways in which you can market your business.